So the problem we can clearly see here that heating and cooling is pretty much coming like a major sort of um, sector which is taking a lot of energy and it's very demanding. And for, like here we, we depend pretty much like we do. Uh, we have to space. Uh, we have to depend on our space heating. In other parts of the world, like in India and Africa and other places in down south, you have other. You know, you have to cool the whole area. So basically, space cooling is required there. And again, there's a big energy consumption or power consumption taking place. So my take here is, although renewable energy has started showing penetration, but it requires aggressive approach from iron. OK, so renewable energy growth scenario. Let me look how photovoltaics, which is one of the major contributors to all amongst all the renewable energy sources. PV leads the race, OK, or the show, but the growth is stabilizing. I can see now. I think it was even under the downturn in around, say, 2008-10. The trend, you know, it flattened a little bit and then it rose further. And then now it is stabilizing, but I think another kick is required. We are producing on in the range of 100 gigawatt of power per year through photovoltaics. Which I, I suggest for a comparison, the total power need for the UK is in the range of 70 gigawatt. And total gigawatt production in terms of PV is 100 gigawatt alone, you see. So definitely per year the contribution which is going on to the power is quite significant but our total consumption worldwide is in the range of 15 terawatt or so so considering that uh, thousand uh, gigawatts of power that is required we're talking 15000 gigawatts right in that 100 gigawatt is very minuscule right so and also, I think I'll just give the example of nations. For instance, the total power coming, you know, for renewables by 2017-18 was this. It was in the range of 1.2 terawatt. Uh, and here, China was taking, you know, it was aggressively growing at that time. Now it is actually doing much, much better than what it shows here. Uh, total EU was 339, but alone China was more than that. Uh, the split says that India actually was rock bottom in, in, in the range of 2008-10, uh, but now it has started showing very big promise. So, but it's, again, it comes from the political push. And as I say, political push is required here because now there's an oil lobby, there's a solar lobby also coming up that I know. So, so there's a tussle going on, it's all political, I think, and, but, all that we cannot deny the fact with the to, to bring down the global warming, we need sources which are not emitting. Yeah, and renewable is a possibility. So take away message from the uh, the the global kind of scenario that I sketched before you is that solar power will soon be the cheapest form of electricity in many regions of the world. We are talking in the range of say four to six cents per kilowatt hour now in major sectors. By assumption is that if with the same growth rate or you know that the way it's happening by 2050 we'll be talking in the range of two to four cents per kilowatt hour of energy. That means the grid parity has already been achieved in many major sectors will be going. It will be the cheapest form of electricity by then. So. And also you can see. Uh, and this is again I have taken from New Energy Outlook 2019, um, which also said like by at least by 2030, the power sector contributes a share towards keeping global temperature from rising more than two degrees centigrade. This is something which I mentioned before, is the kind of target we all have. And UK is actually leader in this direction because um, we are quite concerned about how we are trying to uh, reduce the greenhouse emissions. And I think most of our government policies are targeted towards it. OK, so now the turn comes to to give a little bit kind of uh, introduction on to solar photovoltaics and how the technological developments took place and what I have witnessed so far. Um, 
so here is the uh, slide which always I give even to my students to tell them you know how how we define solar technologies in terms of generations of solar cells. So the first generation you can see here is crystalline silicon technology on the top. Um, and I think you could see, and this is a slide which I uh, took it from my colleagues from Imperial College, I think it was in 2004 or five. Um, and then the scenario was drawn up. Second generation is actually an advancement from first generation, which was wafer based technology to thin film based. Like now thin film is have the advantage that you uh, that wafers actually are th having thickness of almost 250 micron. We can get up to only two micron thickness, you know, one hundredth of the thickness of your hair can absorb all the photons, almost 98 to 99 percent of photons coming from sun which is the advantage. So here the second generation came out of the material utilization. Then came third generation where we talked about uh, spectrum utilization because what happens when you have only single junction, it takes only one part of the band of photons. But if you got two or three material in cascade, then they can actually take more chunk of photons coming from the spectrum of the sun. So it is better utilization of spectrum we can say. And that's what regarded as multi junction solar cell as well. There have been some misnomers. Sometimes dye cell, organic, and perovskites, they are also referred to in third generation, but I will call them like new generation. Yeah, uh, I I'll rather not tell them like third generation. Well, new concepts are also given here, and the spec expectations where there's some new materials will be found someday from maybe biological material or something, uh, but this is a space still to be exploited later. But the estimation then in 2004-05 by BP was like if you go that time the price of electricity coming from renewable or from solar was 30 cents per unit of electricity. And the estimation was that we can have the break even or grid parity attained by 2030. But surprisingly in September 2011 the announcement in U European PV you know, solar energy conference uh, in Germany, it was announced that grid parity has been achieved already in some of the sectors. So in 2020, there are places in majority of the sector, it has already been achieved. In fact, uh, if you buy two megawatt capacity plant turnkey solution from first solar, they will guarantee you four cents of electricity. Yeah, per kilowatt hour of electricity. So, and these turnkey solutions are bound to cover more and more and they're going, going to become cheaper. So uh, definitely the strides have been really going faster than expected. So you can see it was very conservative approach at that time because at the time of million a year only the production for the first time started and the lead was taken by Germany and Japan. And now we are seeing the rise of it and we are talking in the what was the aim like 500 megawatt in a million uh, year 2000 and year 2020 we are over 100 gigawatt production per year. Massive jump. So cost technology if we look into it and this is a famous diagram uh, drawn up by Martin Green. I saw this time um, in 2004 when I was attending a European PV meeting and his estimation was the, you know, the he had two, three scenarios he drew and talked about if you're banking on, say, crystalline silicon, the price would be anywhere around, say, 3.5 per watt peak, right? And then second generation thin films, he said, has a very good chance. You can go up to one, uh, one euro per watt peak. And for new generation, his estimation was that we can go up to 20 cents per watt peak. But can we remember, can we know now the scenario where we're in? This technology, first generation, is here. It's completely inverted pyramid now. And obviously, the promises made by third generation or new generation cells are that we can achieve this. Um, but they got stability issues and all the something I'll discuss maybe later. But this is a kind of strange scenario which happened. Uh, 
And so if you look at the last decade has witnessed a major paradigm shift in conventional thinking and approach, and this is what defies completely inversion of this. I'm um, likes to tell you also about look at the Swanson effect. I mean, the, the module prices of uh, PV were 76.67 in the year 1977. So you could have $76 or $77 per watt of module that you could buy. Now we're talking 0.3, around 0.3 to 0.4. Uh, and I'm talking, sorry, dollar, which means uh, we are talking 20 cents or 30 cents of uh, per watt P. And this has been amazing jump from there. And also what has helped here is the economy of scale where cost of photovoltaic cells fall almost by 20 percent with every doubling of the production. And that is why you see in China, uh, China could bring the cost down because they were making gigawatt production or 300, 500 bigger, you know, uh, production um, limits they were going to go with. This is how they're shown to the world how it can be brought down. And other nations are following the same strategy now. So I think, uh, yeah, the, so we know we know the handle where it's, it exists. So I'll briefly touch uh, the crystalline silicon technologies, all the technology that we know um, and uh, that I have interacted with so far. So Coming to crystalline silicon, I'll just go very brief in, on these. Um, uh, so, I don't know if you're seeing all that on the <laughs> slide. <laughs> uh, so, crystalline silicon. Right, so, yeah. So, this is how the crystalline silicon solar cell, uh, you might have come across the, the you know, blue structures on the roof uh, rooftop. Sometimes you will find them. But they can be sometimes also not very uh, bluish. They can be dark and such dark. Uh, uh, actually, modules are nothing there, but monocrystalline silicon. The efficiency of this is the highest one, which can get up to module efficiency can go up to 22 uh, percent. And here, uh, obviously, this is a structure. You got a wafer to start with at a base. This is a P type wafer, which then we have we take bring about n-type material doping. Uh, it's not a new material we dope. We actually dope with the same material with the depth of that wafer. And so this maybe the top is actually of this layer is converted into say n-type. So it makes a jump uh, kind of graded junction here. And this PN junction which is formed here is the heart of the device. It is the essence of the device. You have to have a kind of barrier or a peer junction or short key junction or some kind of junction which actually can create feel. And so on the top you have different layers, but the contact is important that because all the electrons which are emitted out and going onto the surface, they need to be collected. So you have to have a front collector and the holes to be collected from the rear, which is rear contact. So with the front and back contact with the PN junction is the kind of uh, general structure of any solar cells. Yeah, that we know of in first generation. You can see the application areas coming from. So rooftop is something that you know that is very prevalent, but also not you can achieve degree of transparency by dicing these uh, wafers and putting them into these forms and also putting anti reflection coating. Sometimes you can change the color also by, um, uh, you know, by index matching of of the of the layers. So all that can be tried out. So with the. And you can see uh, these one examples of how you can put into the curtain walls. Uh, so there are a lot of kind of application areas coming out of first generation. Now I'm coming to thin film PV technologies, which is of my more interest and I had been pursuing this very much ever since I started my PhD program. And these are second generation ones which I just discussed. Um, but uh, so you have better material electronic property and significant less thickness. The good part here is that they are direct band gap material. That means they can absorb with lesser thickness of the material itself, which is not possible in silicon because silicon is a indirect band gap material. So you have more you have photonic transition as well as phononic transition, which actually generates heat. OK, and that's the reason why. Frankly speaking, 
crystalline silicon is not the best of the best material for photovoltaics. Yeah, but it is still a market leader. It leads 90 percent. Uh, uh, you know, the market is of silicon only. And the reason is simply because it is very robust technology. You can guarantee 20, 25 years of its lifetime straight away. And this is a problem with other technologies. So. OK, so why I'm exploring thin fin PV technology and something which is uh, by classical physics definition, uh, I will call anything as a thin fin where which grows atom by atom, molecule by molecule, cluster by cluster, and the growth process goes through the steps of these processes where starting with nucleation of small islands, then they coalesce into expanding islands, good, they get bigger, and they finally coalesce to form a kind of a linear structure, a continuous layer form. With this approach of thin film technologies, cadmium telluride was one of the leaders in year 2009-10 when First Solar, the American company, produced almost uh, um, not only it produced the highest uh, production of uh, uh, cadmium telluride modules that year, it brought down the cost for the very first time below one dollar per watt peak. So that was the year in 2009 when they demonstrated that you know cost of that can be brought in effectively, where you could get to close to grid parity. But I think the it. The downturn came at the same time and it actually um, uh, really affected all kind of a great growth were going into PV area then. So there was a kind of things, so, but I think we we came back onto the road and I think we are with a bumpy ride now we're back on track and I think it's going on fine now at the moment. So just to let you know that thin film deposition method, there can be various ways that we can deposit thin films. And this gives the process advantage for us, unlike crystalline silicon. So you can you we can use maybe a range of say vacuum technology like evaporation, sputtering, plasma CVD, MB, and all the or hybrid methods can uh, have the combinations. You, we can also go for chemical vapor uh, deposition methods as the metal organic CVD one, ALDs, the famous ones now coming. So chemical mo mode of deposition is also possible. Then liquid solution based technology is also possible where we can go for chemical bath deposition and electro deposition and some hybrid methods. In fact, this is the area where my professor asked me to concentrate uh, in year 1984 when he said uh, we want to get semiconductors made by low cost methods, right? So uh, he asked me to make gallium arsenide as a material by electro deposition. It was so, so tough. And another material I chose and by bad luck or whatever, it was aluminum antimonide, uh, which could never stay. Uh, you know, the thin film will vanish. Uh, they get immediately hydrolyzed in atmosphere. So, but I have published a paper out of that effort. <laughs> so, uh, okay. So, look at the possibilities that it is. So, this is just an example of how sputtering, and this is kind of schematics of how. Uh, sputtering takes place. You got to have a chamber where you can strike plasma and the plasma then actually the you can apply power to it where the argon or whatever inert gases that you put in will create plasma. They can then go and hit target and release the atoms which are dislodged from the target and then they can go and get deposited onto the substrate. You can change the uh, substrate temperature. You can have partial pressure, you can have co-sputtering, you can have lots of sput uh, possibilities within this. Likewise, you can also have MB kind of evaporation where you can have these crystals, which are also known as effusion sources, where you can have uh, uh, precise control on thickness and you can make the deposition go almost epitaxial. And that's what the advantage you get here. So you have better control on electronics of the material. Uh, Close sublimation process is another process. This is purely heat and a sublimation process. So you keep the substrate very close to actually the, the material itself. And then it's uh, the heating up to 500 to 600 degrees centigrade takes the flux of material and gets deposited. So it's a sublimation process which happens, uh, which deposits things. Cadmium telluride 
why first solar applies this approach, takes this approach. Spray is another possibility, and so and spray is also regarded as one of the standard thin film techniques. So electrostatics, and we are working on this electro uh, field, uh, electric field assisted spray deposition, and we are working very closely with our collaborators in IIT Delhi and um, IIC Bangalore. So this is something which I was suggesting, the electro deposition, something which I had tried out in my thesis, although not a single word of electro deposition was utilized in any of my chapters. Uh, but I, instead, I use chemical bath to deposit colloidal particles of cadmium sulfide, which I'll tell you later how my interests came into uh, trailing of the band gap of the materials and doing the band gap engineering uh, sort of things. And that interest uh, led me to what I am now here. So there are other methods which I would not rate into classical thin film type, just like doctor blading, screen printing, I would not say spray pyrolysis, but screen printing and doctor blade, particularly I'll tell them like, well, they are not thin film. They are, they, I will rate them as a thick film method. So that's the division of uh, how, as a physicist, I view the processes uh, as thick and th uh, thin film types. So quickly to tell you that the first successful thin film device which came to existence and could go to commercial four was amorphous silicon. It was discovered in Dundee. So it is again UK who took initiative in discovering it, but it could not capitalize. And this is a problem that we have in Britain. So not we do a lot of um, uh, new uh, you know, initial development uh, innovations come but uh, capitalizing in terms of manufacturing is something we have not done in recent past. And I think it's the need of the hour that we have to relook and into, I think government are really thinking about this uh, COVID attack when we were uh, limited by what we can produce locally. So I think all these things are coming back and probably will have to be more serious on this. But going back to Marfa Silicon, uh, the limitation, limitation this technology had was because it's amorphous in character, uh, there are a lot of defect states by nature. So when we make a PN junction out of it, say amorphous silicon, you can dope and make it N-type or P-type. But if you make a junction of PN, because of the high number of uh, surface states, electron and hole pairs which are generated in the material, they are completely absorbed or uh, completely sucked by these defect states around. Yeah, and so, uh, you get Fermi level pinning and you can't get any kind of action. You, there's no charge separation taking place, so there can't be any photovoltaic generation. So the strategy of putting intrinsic layer in between of almost like 300 to 400 nanometer was tried out, while this P-type material thickness could be anywhere around say 25 nanometer to 30. So you can imagine the thickness uh, dimension I'm talking, yeah? We're talking very precise dimensions, 30 nanometer to or so. So total stack of amorphous silicon, the first time it was made was about one less than a micron, which means the light which entered here was not completely captured. And so maybe 30, 40% of light passed through the whole thing because it was transparent to the uh, other wavelengths. So what was done, that's why the texturing, you could see the texturing of the back reflector sometimes are put on to reflect back those radiations so to harness them better. And another strategy then was utilized was to use two layers, maybe use a microcrystalline and amorphous layer both. So that's why it's, this structure is called micromorph. And it also added because we're capturing more photons than single junction. So it captured more photons. So we have higher efficiency numbers achieved on here. Problem with this kind of technology was that initial 14 or 15% efficiency, which was achieved, we could lose the numbers straight away in a few weeks down to about 5 or 6%. The reason was stabler Ronsky effect because under effect of light, these passivated layer that we do with hydrogen, uh, you know, amorphous silicon, we passivate the layer to for these, you know, the, the, to bring down the effect of recombination by the surface states. Um, but what happened, the light was actually opening up those um, passivation layers, 
and making them hungry again to capture electron holes. So that is an intrinsic issue of amorphous silicon, and that is the reason why the efficiency numbers of the modules could not cross 10 percent. And the thumb rule of the industry in PV is now that any technology which cannot go more than 15 percent is out of picture or out of game. And that became the reason for debacle of United Solar. Uh, early Solar, United Solar, who were pursuing, in fact, by in 2010, Subhendu Guha, the CEO of uh, so United Solar, I was actually invited him for one of the conference that we're organizing here through IOP. And uh, he had, um, you know, um, amazing plans. He, he said, well, in 2010, we are going to expand our, uh, ex you know, ex expansion of our factories from, say, uh, 300 megawatt to 600 megawatt doubling or like all those kind of things. But in few years time, we, we saw that they just vanished from the scene. So you never know what kind of problem you are because you're, you're in competition with different technologies. So it is very important that intrinsic issues like amorphous silicon phase that are taken care of quickly. Otherwise, the technology can be really quickly put off and can be out of the game. Now, coming to CIGS technology, which is one of my favorite technologies, and I'm pursuing some activities still in my Sunrise program. And uh, well, this is something you can see. This is a substrate configuration. That means the layers you build on from choosing a substrate. So choice of substrate is here the advantage. So you can try on different range of materials, like you can have glass substrate, you can have a metal, you can have a foil, you can have a polymer foil or a ceramic. So you can have a number of choices here that you can start with. So if you have a metal contact on the substrate, which is moly generally we take here, then this is called absorber, and then we have cadmium sulfide, which, which makes junctions. This is N-type material, and CIG is P-type. So a junction is formed as a PN junction. Then you have top contact as a TCO, which is called transparent conducting oxide, which is very important element for any thin film solar cell. And generally, this is a, a aluminum doped zinc oxide, which is used here in this technology. Um, and current state of the art is we can go up to 23.3% is the latest figure. So it's, it's a very high number compared to 26.5 single junction for HIT cells, which is now uh, for silicon. And But the scope is still that you can go up to 30%, you know, Silicon has achieved almost the limit of 27% uh, of efficiency it can go up to for single junction. But for band gap that CIGS has, we can go up to 30% in that. And so there's a and so there's a potential of you know taking this uh, efficiency numbers further up. On flexible foil, this is amazing number. You can see 20.8% by done by one of my collaborators and also my group leader at um, at Lovebra University, uh, Professor Ayodhya Tiwari, who is now in MPA in Zurich, a part of ETH Zurich, who makes who has a world record of uh, developing CIGS on polyamide foil. And he has a uh, funding from Tata. He's got 60 million to build um, uh, those modules that he's developing. Uh, I think he's doing for niche application at the moment because uh, it's, it's a quite exotic kind of process that he takes it through. So here you can see the key processing step is the substrate temperature and sodium incorporation. But this is something is a holy grail. We did not know sodium from substrate soda lime glass was entering into the absorber. And if you're not do, developing anything on, say, glass, which is soda lime glass, the efficiency numbers were coming out very low. They were in the range of three to five percent only. But solar lime, solar lime took the numbers to more than 10% straight away. And so we later, and this is still is seen as a kind of uh, a process, and we want to understand what actually sodium is going and doing in there. Obviously, it is trying to help, uh, you know, the release of electron hole pairs that we know, but uh, the exact mechanism is still under kind of uh, investigation. Solar Frontier, Solar Frontier Japan is the leader in this technology area and who are bringing one gigawatt capacity per year or more now, I think. Um, so you can see that, you know, uh, but this is a technology of choice because of choice of substrate that you can have. 
in, in you know, and Tata Steel is quite keen. And, uh, and I have seen, well, I have a, uh, I, Professor Tiwari and I actually wrote this um, uh, proposal, Innovate UK, it was called TSB then in 2007. And we had a funding of about 800k to build this machine. So it, we were trying to look for turnkey solution. The problem with ThinFin technology with the complexity of the process is that there is no off the shelf equipment that you can buy for crystalline silicon one. You can buy temperature furnaces. You know the process. You know how to manage the temperature zones, etc. You can um, how much uh, pockel gas that you want to actually take on. So everything is known and you can buy a turnkey solution. But we do we have a problem here in uh, thin film, uh, you know, technology like CIG Skettle, right? That they are very much oriented towards uh, uh, the companies who actually hold the, uh, the IP around that. And it's not kind of public, like you can't have turnkey solutions unless you buy from them. So uh, we were trying to find a reason. Can we not actually bring down the cost by finding a solution? So this was made on the basis that if we carry out says all the five process, all the five layers on glass we grow by robotic arm that we are putting in into the vacuum chamber. And so this is a kind of load lock chamber and here we're planning to make a sputter chamber. So for MB's uh, chamber for operation to say sputtering without breaking vacuum, that was the idea. We could actually grow Molly and then we can grow CIGS and cat sulfide and then AZO layers, all four or five layers you can grow in without breaking the vacuum. That means process ad advantage could be taken up here by because if you break the vacuum, then I think you're then it, it can't be like competitive process in industry where if you're again trying to back up, create the same level of vacuum back again or create plasma back again, you have to spend energy and energy is money. So it's so again boils down to the electricity cost. I think so we have now this getting installed at South Bank. Uh, with scientific vacuum system, I'm going to go with a spin out. Uh, soon something is being talked about. Uh, and I have planned basically, we have demonstrated already here that we can get up to 12 to 14 percent cells were made by my student in Heritage Water University in 2014-15. And we can achieve with this process state of the art level. Uh, the transition, I want to take it from glass to metal foil like steel. Uh, and this has a capability to go up to 30 by 30 centimeter. So this is a thing which I'm involved in scale up activities on, say, CIJ solar cells. Uh, apart from vacuum method I mentioned, I also am constantly working also on to um, low cost approach of making them. This is how I started my work in photovoltaics. So I'm not uh, opposed to taking Dr. Blading, for instance, or screen printing or spray paralysis techniques. I'm working on these simultaneously. And my quest is basically, I was talking to Saura the other day, that can we not start modeling the, the process which we carry out under vacuum and, one, and, and, and say non-vacuum methods, and we find out what are the limitations and what are the critical points which are happening as a process so so that we understand more and we can take advantage by understanding more, you know and bring down the cost or by by reducing the complication of the process itself so this is two step process so first is where we deposit layers by these methods which could be copper indium gallium the metals are actually uh, layers are made on glass or wherever foils. Then we use, uh, which is used by spray deposition. This is a, a setup that I built at um, Ludbury University, and I have it also at South Bank. Then we take this uh, metal deposition to selenium reactor with a pneumatic flow of nitrogen at two zone furnace. We can create, actually, we can bake the substrate and we can create CIGS material. This two step process is also used by uh, so, uh, Solar Frontier in Japan, who are making very high efficiency numbers, almost 20% and above those cells are made out here. So something which I'm also looking into and kind to compare with the other technology that I have 
um, to deposit a clean method, a vacuum based method of deposition. I'm coming quickly uh, because I'm conscious of time, so we have lost uh, some time in the in the beginning. So it's already, I think. Uh, so thin film cat. How much time have we got, dear? Sorrow. Um, you can wrap in five to ten minutes, Professor Ali. Okay, so this will be a challenge. Okay, I'm trying though. So cattail ride is another technology. is very similar to as you see uh, see the structure with CIGs. I'm not dwelling too much here, but First Solar is a company who are who got up to 22% here and they are probably the cheapest kind because the method advantage is here. They, you can go up to, they're making regularly two gigawatt production uh, and the cost, they're very cost effective technology. Um, I have utilized this technology to one of my TSB uh, uh, grant, which I won in 2008 with Pilkington and Arab were involved in applied multi-layer company who actually brought their uh, sputter system. So we we using all sputtering to make these kind of cadmium telluride cad, cad sulfide layers in this kind of uh, structure architecture. And the, uh, the project was all about creating semi transparent layers uh, in, a, in a kind of double glaze unit. And we effectively could go up to 4.9, about 5% at about 300 to 400 nanometer of thickness of layer that we made, which was almost like golden tinge color. You can see through the glass. And this was the architectural point that Arab was quite interested with. Well. But uh, we could not take this further in the third year because applied multi-layers company, they went burst <laughs> in, in 2009-10 because of, uh, you know, the, the situation in, was not very good if, uh, you know, globally. So somehow this was, we came to a halt in this program. But uh, something we have the IP here uh, in terms of uh, the state of the art that we developed at that time. And with any possible um, opportunity, I'd like to come back. Third generation solar cell is something which I thought is my hot area and the latest area of development. And something which I, I did in 2005 with Professor Mike, what because uh, I was at Imperial College working on uh, disensitized solar cells when I came to UK in 2002. Uh, I wanted to take advantage of using CIGS technology with uh, Professor Tiwari then in uh, Loughborough University. And I went to Michael Gress's lab and developed this tandem cell first time. And we had a step jump of almost 2% absolute jump of efficiency numbers. So from 13%, we got 15 per. 15.1 and under unmatched condition we could go up to 16 percent as well but you could see the the voltage got added on so we got say uh, sin, a single tandem was giving up to 1.42 volts and there was current matched here you can see the the photons from red and blue region were overlapping quite yeah and this is one example that something that you can take it from say third generation cells because having two materials you can capture photons from two regions right so and this is the evidence that we have obviously we published that in 2006 that paper got some very good citation that was very first uh, work on tandem cell for um, thin film solar cell types and we had that record then high mobility tco is another area of activity that i pursue very much and I specialize in fact in this because we just not normal TCOs, we were producing high mobility TCOs with tandem application. The reason is here because when you make tandems to two layers of CIGS and say perovskite or anything, you compromise in the NIR region, you can see the FTO or the glass coated with TCO eats up all the photons in NIR region. You can see the decline here. And the device performance was pretty much noted to decline the same way in this region of uh, photons. So what we did by tweaking this mobility, keeping the same uh, or reducing this M and increasing this, we could keep the mobile, uh, say the conductivity same, almost the same order, but we could see the handle. We could go the transparency of this, you know? So the transparency window of our TCO could go up to say 1800 nanometer flat. 
And that gives us advantage of using cascade or multiple stacks of uh, layers. So something which we are working on at the moment in Sunrise. So new generation approach, which I say, which I'm working on, see the criteria for new generation is that we can get all the advantages together. Like we can make thin film types, direct band gap material we can choose, we can have high efficiency like multi-junction approach we can take. Abundance is not an issue there. They are non-toxic material we can choose, stable, durable, low processing cost advantage. All these are something that we are trying to explore what we call as new generation. And disensitized solar cells, which I actually, this is something which I built in 2003, January, <laughs> I remember, and I'm holding this and uh, Saif was actually uh, shining, taking picture. Um, we actually got 6% uh, of cell on PET foil first time. And this is on polyamide foil, which I did with the classic uh, spins, uh, high temperature sintering. But here, the sintering of titania was done at low temperature, room temperature only. The idea was derived from a photosynthesis process. Uh, Michael Gressel, who's the inventor of this technology in Switzerland and um, in Lausanne, EPFL, See how similar they are like. So it's a photophysics involved in this whole process. What I can tell you that this type of material uh, and the, the device, it doesn't follow this rule like PN junction we had in crystalline silicon. It has a different approach altogether for mechanism of charge separation. So in 2010, uh, I formed a team in India. This was something which I took advantage of my connection back home in India, and I could build a team and we won 5 million in the first phase and 3 million in the next. Uh, so two phases of 10 to 18 March. Uh, we carried out the work together with this, this team. You can see the uh, built up of the team that we have and the companies were involved from UK side and India were involved in this whole game. And actually, uh, this what helped me because our idea was to get this disensitized solar cells that you can develop like this, right? You can have titania compact film make on glass first, then you have another layer, which is porous titania, which you can dye, so sensitize with the, some dyes like ruthenium dyes. Then from other side, you bring a glass plate with platinum coated, bring it together, strap it. You just fill in the gap with liquid, which is iodine, iodide electrolyte, and you have a cell. You can do, you can fabricate the cell in two hours in the lab. So, so this is how. And in year 2012, I think I was the probably I was the first to, to make 10% mark in this um, technology. And this is evidence which we had, and we took advantage in Apex because that was our target to achieve. And you can see here, I also went on to make 10 by 10 centimeter size of module which are interconnected. So this is a W configuration of interconnection of this. Um, there were no wires connection here. They were all interconnected within say laser scribing. So we use laser and mechanical scribes to connect them all together. And you can see the 10 uh, strips are leading to 5.77 volts, while each strip is giving about 700 millivolt. So it was, we could see VOC is 0.75 here. So there was a natural addition from 10 strips. OK, mechanism, I'm not going to dwell too much here, but all you can see, we want very fast injection and we want to avoid this charge recombination in the device. Um, again, you can see the evidence is that this injection is very fast, which is quite characteristic of the photophysics in plants in photosynthesis process, while the recombination is in the millisecond. And that's the reason why, because reaction goes forward with this fast speed. That's why the charge transfer separation is taking place. We cannot talk about here like in PN junction, we have charge space region because here we are talking about particles of nano size, 10 nanometer to 30 nanometer only. And so you cannot have the charge, you know, uh, uh, space charge layer formation just like you have the band bending, etc. in PN junction in a classical manner. So it follows completely different mechanism. Then came perovskite because in Apex we're targeting to get solid state dye cell. And this is where the breakthrough with Henry Snaith came in, who 
actually developed uh, instead of say dyes that we're using, he used uh, perovskite as a kind of uh, uh, kind of absorber layers, and suddenly we got very high numbers. There was transition from 3.9 liquid junction to almost 25 percent that we are making in our regularly in our labs now, and this is what. Uh, the advantage of this wonder material, what we call it now. And Henry took advantage of this. And on fact, he's, uh, he's a world leader now. He's got a company called Oxford PV. He's got mi hundreds of millions of pounds now to take this to the next level. So there's a big hope with this. The only caveat in this is that um, even after winning the Apex uh, uh, Newton Prize, we knew that uh, the challenges we still had, like, and these are listed here as numbers I can see. Uh, probably uh, I have to rush now because I have less, less time left. But you can see these are limitation of this technology, shy against say, humidity and all. Uh, but we are working on that to really find the solutions for that. So one of the things that we had tried out very recently with the IICT Hyderabad people who are experts actually in developing uh, materials, so they have developed, with my advice, a uh, new hydrophobic hole transporter for stable PSCs. So we got up to 11.2%, and you could dip the whole device in water for two hours. The advantage we took of whole transporting layer, that was a kind of a sealant, it was acting like a sealant. And that's why it was a hydrophobic coating on the top, which was also uh, giving advantage of hole collection. So it was doing two jobs together, and this is something we published. In fact, I wanted to actually patent it, but, but Indian partners were keen to publish it quickly. <laughs> so because uh, going for patent is not a very easy process in India. So anyway, so we published it. Uh, flexible solar cell, this is another thing that we are working on with one of my colleagues, uh, Saga Jain, who have hired him. Uh, uh, in January, but he's going to go into Cranfield University. He's got a senior lecturer position over there. So, but we're going to still be working together on that. Uh, something uh, he we developed like 14% uh, perovskite solar cells on factor with foils, and something that uh, Sora and I want to take advantage of this uh, to go for roll to roll production lines. And the beauty of this technology is that under indoor condition, the efficiency number goes very high. So, so for instance, if we are for one sun intensity, uh, we are getting say 25% efficiency under low light condition like here, uh, 500 lux and um, region, you can increase the efficiency in, the harvesting becomes even more efficient. So these are, and we are working also with a new material, lead free material because lead could be a problem in the material itself. So we are working on lead free materials also. We have gone more than 10%, which is again at an advantage. So we are in the leading clubs at the moment. One of the things the Sagar has actually turned out developing is this 24.7% efficient cells. And they were actually uh, evaluated by third party also. Uh, the advantage here is that we have used, other than Spyro as a whole transporting layer, Spyro amiotad is a very costly material. I think the cost of it is that more than the gold actually. So, but we are that's why we are willing to have alternative layers, like I mentioned to one of my ICT Hyderabad guys. So, but the but we are getting high numbers, which is a great thing. Quantum dot cells are which are very much like uh, advantage we can take, uh, you know, because you can have leverage on tweaking its band gap, which is a part of my thesis. Um, uh, PhD thesis, and so something which I'm taking advantage here in actually making nanostructuring. In fact, diasensitized solar cells are the first nanostructured solar device, and after that we are finding range of devices coming up, uh, one way or the other. But I say future is definitely bright here. Um, like I give you an example of how the band gap tailing was achieved by me. Uh, uh, taking advantage, I think something is not going well. Sorry about that, Sorrow. <laughs> it's taking extra seconds. <laughs> okay. 
Yeah. Um, so, uh, I don't know why it's slow. Yeah, so what we could do by adding lead into cadmium sulfide, uh, I have done in my thesis, I could tweak the gap. I could bring it down from 2.4 down to 1.7, and which I repeated here with the Dysense Trisolar Cell regime also while I was in Lafpra. Uh, and with my colleague at Imperial College, we uh, carried out this test. And uh, we, we could see that even tens, tin sulfide and number of chalcogenides we can use now, and we are working on that in our sunrise uh, as, as a kind of alternative. So here the advantage is that you can tweak the band gap, so you can harness different photon bands. One of the advantages of my work on colloidal or nanocrystals that I was pursuing was this, that suddenly I discovered this material, uh, sorry, the device, which I published in 1995. You can see it's called polarity dependent memory switching. And this is offshoot of something I was doing, unintentional, but it happened. And I've just taken the excerpts from my paper that I discovered these expectations were not belied. What started as an academic curiosity is a relatively meaningful device, results which are described below. And these are something we saw. We published with great difficulty. And this was one of the examples I'm telling. Sometimes we do the processing of coatings. Some unintentional layers can come in and can give some range of other device properties. And this was one example, such example here we did. These in unintentional layers that we, we thought were forming were, pro, you know, this is a conjecture at that time. Now it's being proven pretty much. Uh, and why I'm saying because this uh, Chua was the person in 1971 who has predicted a four circuital element like resistor, capacitors and inductor, which are very well known elements. The fourth possibility was if you can have the derivative of the flux with the magnetism, then you can have this kind of memory effects, figure eight type of memory. And this was first example of how I was able to get figure eight memory here, very much like here. And this was again taken to by HP in 2008, when they published this article in 2009. But we came to know that they had patented the same idea. And I think we challenged them because they were saying as we, we do it in 95. So, but something which I came to UK to pursue this activity at Imperial College, but I could never do this because I got success more into PV side <laughs> and I could never get time to get on to probe it. But sometime I feel I would be able to do it. Quickly to say that Sunrise program that I'm leading at the moment, uh, well, I'm a deputy coordinator along with Swansea, who are leads here, but uh, we have Tata Clean Tech and Tata Steel as our partners, Energy Pilkington, Oxford P, we all together in this game. And our plan is to actually take the advantage of perovskite and the materials that we are making to next level for energy positive homes. And building as power station is the concept. And there's a company called BIPB Corp, which is a spin off of Swansea. And this is where they are interested for my CIJS tool that I showed you in the beginning. Then we can go up to 30 by 30 centimeter high efficiency numbers. They are procuring these cells from China at the moment, but they want to do it in-house, maybe here locally. And that's why we are going to go with the spin out thingy. Maybe let's see what how it goes. Uh, but the demonstration of making UK's first energy positive classroom was demonstrated in Swansea by um, our Swansea team. And we are taking this technology and we might be actually replacing with other uh, perovskites and other bits and pieces together that will try to take advantage. The natural advance you can see, Swansea with their insulation, which is not throughout the year, still it behaved like energy positive home, you know, and these are the uh, description they had uh, of the energy positive. They were producing more pa power than they were utilizing, more energy than they were utilizing. In Indian condition, where we have more than two times insulation, definitely we are we can expect maybe two or three times of this what you have here, and we can have much more utilization. And this is what we want to take a design uh, more uh, tuned towards say villages. 
Peruskite module and tandem cell we are planning also in Sunrise. We, our aim is to get up to 30 percent, which is theoretically possible. Theoretical predictions are that you can go up to 44 percent. Yeah, so with the combination of Peruskites and CIJs, and this is for something I'm aiming as well. Roll to roll manufacturing is again is as I said is some, the ultimate thing that we want to take process advantage of. And like these rows, Ampa I mentioned about Ayodhya Tiwari, his company, Flissam, who are making these rows, but they are, now they are making standard size, one, one meter width almost, uh, with the help of Tata. And so uh, the challenge is again that, you know, how then we do it on flexible foil precisely. Obviously, uh, Professor Tiwari has his modules already made, so they have found out the solution, but I think it's not so cost effective still, but uh, I think as the the process advantage goes better and they master the process which they are mastering. Uh, the thing is they can reduce the price of that also by uh, economy of scale production. The advantage of thin film is that you the module that you see, you can't see any wiring in here like you see in case of crystalline silicon, which got physically soldered and wired. Anyway, so I'd like to conclude my uh, talk by saying that material engineering and affordable process development had been at the focal point of increase in efficiency of solar cells that we have witnessed in last two decades. And a majority of sectors in location in the world have now proving that the cost of electricity is going down. Uh, obviously, you have uh, crystalline silicon again is the market leaders, uh, the, which is still the first generation. So the crux the most robust. So robustness or the stability of the technology is paramount to go into uh, say commercial four and something that we are driven by that and all the research that we are working at the moment to see how can we make them more robust, whether we are working organic or diesel or perovskites. Um, but these are disruptive technologies which India can take advantage and that's the reason why Tata is very keen and they are sitting with us in our uh, team. Uh, the predictions are that by 2050, if we, we reach the module efficiency by almost 30 percent and the prices can go in the range of two to four cents per kilowatt hour, which is almost half what we are paying now for electricity cost. So reduction in the weight is another feature for flexible CIGS because at the moment the module of crystalline silicon are about 15 kilogram per meter square, but if you make them flexible, you can go down to almost like two kilogram or even below. And that is where your installation cost, because your handling and installation cost goes low, you don't have to have additional structure on your roof, especially on the old houses, which are built, Nash built in 1930s. They require planning permission and you have to build extra kind of support layer, which takes the installation cost almost like 150%. And that was a major blocker in BIPV segment. So with this, I would like to thank my collaborators from industry and academia, and also like to thank GCRF, uh, the current uh, and EPSRC, who are my funding agencies, um, and Newton Fund, uh, and all uh, my collaborators who have contributed to my work. And finally, to say that this is something we are working on. We are going to have next meeting of its formation on 6th of November. So this is a new center, which I'm co-heading with Graham Edmund. My, who works on cooling and heating area. And this London Center of Energy Engineering uh, is something that's going to come soon. Thank you for your attention. I hope I have not taken much of your time. Thank you, Professor Harry. Really uh, fascinating. <laughs> Lot of new insights in, in one package. Um, I can see Indrath has one question asked. Uh, Indrath, do you want to say it again? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you for the for the talk, uh, Harry. It's, it's, a, it's a very great, great talk. Uh, and then I, I'm working on the same uh, area uh, pretty much, but I focus on the uh, uh, quantum cutting uh, down and up conversion uh, for for PV. Right. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm best. By the way, I'm, I'm lecturer at uh, Cranfield University. Oh, interesting. Wow. Yeah. Oh, you're so close to me. <laughs> 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 yes. Um, so the 
uh, my question was that the the biggest challenge with with perovskite perovskite like you say is is very very uh, promising but then the biggest challenge uh, is always uh, like you say the stability and then uh, also the the use of of uh, lead and maybe some other uh, heavy metal and then that's why every time uh, so I'm, I'm currently running two innovate uk projects and then whenever i talk about perovskite the, the industry the pv industry not only uh, in in Europe, but also globally, always say these two things: um, stability, lead. yeah, and and heavy metal with lead. Right? Of course, we we can have uh, an organic uh, perovskite, but always those two uh, issues are are always coming. Uh, so my question is: uh, uh, Do you have any thoughts on on how to overcome? Uh, what would be the 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 nearest, the closest, the easiest way to overcome these challenges? Um, and then uh, would be great to, to hear your, yeah, your thought think, on this. I think it's a very good question and it's very pertinent to what we are actually looking into. Uh, and we are working very closely with our partners in India who are material specialists. So one thing is because it's a long molecule, right? Uh, so it's very labile to get attacked from outside uh, in terms of chemistry language, we say, right? That is why it has not gone through the leach test. Leach test is where if you put dilute acids and see if your material can dissolve quickly, like in terms of acid rain situation, then it can uh, go down to the, you know, back into the earth and can come, can, uh, can come back through the water streams back to you. Yeah, so it kind of uh, uh, something that you don't want that in the pollutants. It can go like a pollutant and and lead is a heavy metal, which is again not seen as a favorite material in whole of the Europe. So that is a major blocker. So if lead being there, although Oxford PV and all of us were saying there's a very small amount, still the leach test, when you go to very large area of production, it becomes large amount, right? A leach test and something to make it stable that it withstand the leach test would be required. And we are working on that number one side. And also then we're looking into alternative strategy of replacing lead by another metal. So currently we're working with tin. OK, so we are replacing tin, uh, lead by tin, and we have achieved more than 10 percent already. The limit is if we can go up to, say, 20 percent. Yeah, state of the art efficiency crossing 20 percent and you can see perovskite as an advantage straight away because processing advantage is here with this material. OK, you have advantage of tweaking also its band gap. Yeah, with the just by adjustment of these atoms. So with these, so you can have all perovskite tandems also made. So if you achieve say 20 percent, all perovskite tandems can take you anywhere around 25 to 30 percent anyway. So these are the current kind of process and thoughts around the scientists going on and these are current activities in fact we are also working on all the time yeah so happy to work with you and collaborate with you later if you have some thoughts around this but i can share more on this later with you i hope this helps thank you thank you so much thanks professor we have about five minutes if somebody has more questions please feel free to ask yeah, I'm happy here. So I have one question, Professor Ali. Sure. Because our network is about promoting digitalization in surface manufacturing or coatings per se in this case. How do you see this agenda of thematic agenda of UK's digitalization can facilitate this massive journey or massive mission that you have undertaken on promoting uh, renewable energy and which particular digitalization tools if you know, would probably be able to help. Uh -huh. I think it's a it's a question that I was indirectly conveying through my talk, not directly though. What I was trying to show that thin film technology, which I'm pursuing, has a process advantage. So you could actually take a range of processes, thin film deposition processes that you can take in order to tweak your material or make your material. Yeah. Now the question is, as you go away from crystalline silicon, the because it's either binary or ternary or quaternary, yeah, 
adjustment and getting the right stoichiometry, right process control of the thickness around the whole large area, you know, all these things are very, very disturbing facts. And I tell you, even with a company in Taiwan, I was in very in touch with those who in 2014 came with the world record of CIGS and they announced three months later, they announced the closure of the company. And that was a big surprise to us. Why did they do so? The reason they did it, I know from inner corners, that it was again the, the uniformity. So the champion cell was obviously given high efficiency numbers. When they ramp it up, they have the issues of this uniformity, you know. So thickness uniformity, <coughs> you can also say like composition uniformity, all those factors do kick in. Something, uh, you know, when Ashutosh was describing about that call came in and I saw, oh, wow, this is so fitting with this, you see. So it is a manufacturing challenge. Frankly speaking, it's, it's, that's why I feel very uh, fortunate that I am uh, with experts who are doing digitalization and we can actually take the process advantage and digital twin techniques like that, you know, to actually perfect the art of making them. For instance, I'm giving example. <coughs> we are seeing that during the process, if plasma sputtering is ongoing, Plasma during the course of its time changes. <coughs> the constituent can change as well. <coughs> I'm sorry. Which means if the constitution is changing, the material property, electronic property will change and the whole device will change. So keeping that uniform, having high yield is a very, very big challenge here in this, in this area, particularly with thin films not for crystalline silicon, right? And that is why crystalline silicon is the leader. But the reason why it's leader because crystalline silicon came from electronic industry, mind it. And it's the most studied material known. Yeah, so a lot of effort has to go in. We have to club together and do a lot of digging in here. And I something I was discussing with you about how can we take non-vacuum and vacuum processes together to see how it's, what's going on here, right? Sure. To work with you we collaborate on this any other questions <coughs> i think your talk was so self-explanatory i i think probably <laughs> everybody understand everything readily okay. <laughs> sorry Swarab, this is uh, ashir uh, oh. yes ash, please was, uh, fascinating talk uh, professor harry uh, and i do feel that uh, you know digitalization in some sectors like aerospace automotive has been quite well researched quite well adopted um, however, in the areas that you are dealing with, given that you are kind of working in an area where technologies are continuously changing and it's yeah. at, uh, the boundaries of, of our knowledge of physics, um, there is a lot of uh, lot of opportunities for kind of modeling techniques, visualization techniques to be used, instrumentation techniques to be used. Yeah. So I think I think what you're what you're talking really revealed is the uh, is the kind of the set of opportunities available to us as a research community, both kind of working in your area as well as in digital manufacturing. So, so very exciting talk. I think I think you spot on this because I, some I have a feeling Ash that uh, these techniques can be you know translated here. It's just, it's just a matter of experts coming to and brainstorming and taking it through the next level. And I think this is where you can in high value manufacturing. So if you can take the yield of these kind of exotic materials, uh, you know, you can take process advantage and your man manufacturing, you can bring down the cost by doing so massively. Uh, absolutely. absolutely. No, thank you. It's a very thank you for comments. It's a good one. Um, if there are no other questions, then uh, I would say I'm really sorry. A lot I, I've you. taken a lot of time. So I have not left no, it's fine. questions, perhaps. <laughs> no, I, I would say, Harry, that it was very insightful and comprehensive and very, very interesting. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Yeah. So on behalf of DSM, I would like to congratulate you, first of all, Professor Harry, for taking this great initiative. And of course, at the same time, thank Thanks you for sharing these great insights and details and also be uh, taking this 
pain in this difficult times to do this in the DSM event. And although we had cert certain difficulties with the software that we all ought to have sometimes. Yeah. But again, many thanks from our end to, to take this initiative. Part and parcel, I think we have to go by that. We have to go positively, you know. <laughs> No, thank, thank you once you. again and Eric, thank you all the participants to be there uh, and listening to this fascinating thanks for bearing talk. with me all, all of you please thank you thank, thank you. you thanks bye